Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a and um, What we're going to cover today will be the heart anatomy notes. So we will probably get um, about halfway through this set of notes. Um, on your syllabus, it says that we'll have our first lecture exam happening next week, um, February 4th, 5th, 4th through the 5th. Um, but that's not going to happen that week. It's going to actually happen um, the week after that, so the week of February 8th, um, the 11th through the 12th. Um, my grandmother passed away, and so we I won't be in town um, for Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday of next week. Um, I still give lectures and have those lectures posted for you, but I, I'm, I'm going to push that exam back a week. So um, that exam is going to actually move. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And I will also post an announcement about that exam being moved. All right, so last chapter we talked about the blood, and that the main jobs of the blood were to carry oxygen um, for the red blood cells and to carry nutrients and carry waste products um, to and away from the cells. We talked about how the white blood cells have an immune response, and we also talked about um, how platelets have a role in clotting. And we even talked about at length about um, the process of recycling white blood cells and the process of recycling um, 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 making white blood cells in the process of making um, red blood cells erythropoiesis and thromboparesis of making platelets. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about the heart. We're not going to really focus on blood vessels just yet. We'll have a whole other um, unit that will be devoted to that. But for right now, we're going to talk about the heart um, anatomy first and then how the heart functions. So the heart is considered a double pump. And we call it a double pump because it has two circuits, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. The pulmonary circuit is going to carry blood to and from um, the gas exchange surfaces of the lungs. So when you think of pulmonary, think about the lungs there. And the systemic circuit is going to go just to the rest of the parts of your body. So um, both both the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit are going to include a discussion of veins and arteries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart, and on models they're usually colored red, and veins carry blood back to the heart, and on models they're usually colored like a dark purple or a blue. Um, and the reason for that is that arteries carry oxygenated blood and veins carry deoxygenated blood. So blood is going to alternate between the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. It's a nice loop for this double pump. There are three types of blood vessels that we'll be discussing for the next few weeks here, um, arteries, veins, and capillaries. Arteries or efferent vessels carry blood away from the, the heart. Um, a nice easy way to remember that is A for arteries, A for away. Veins are going to be the afferent vessels, and they're going to carry blood to the heart. Don't really have a fancy mnemonic device for that, but um, just know that arteries carry blood away from the heart, so veins have to carry it in the opposite direction. And as we'll see in the next set of notes that we cover, that because of the role of arteries and veins in the directions in which they carry blood, they're going to be structured or anatomically um, structured differently from one another. They don't look the exact same. And then capillaries are what we call our, the exchange vessels, and they're just the networks between the arteries and veins. Although we consider the functional aspect of your heart to be a double pump, your heart has four chambers. So you have a right atrium, you have a left atrium, you have a right ventricle, you have a left ventricle. The atria are on top of the heart, and the ventricles are on the bottom. So what I'm drawing now is like a generic Valentine's Day heart, which is not what your heart looks like. But this is easier for me to just draw this. So if we were to take this Valentine's Day heart, and kind of cut it into four spots. We would have our right atria here that I'll just denote RA, our left atria, and um, we'd have our, and actually I did that backwards. I did my right and left and not their right and left. How do I get rid of this? Yeah, all right, there we go. So go back to our Valentine's Day heart. So 
So we have our right atria, left atria, right ventricle, left ventricle. The right side of the heart is going to collect blood from the systemic circuit. So the blood that comes into the right side of the heart is first going to dump off into the right atria because it's the top part. So this little red blood cell that comes in here is deoxygenated. It goes into the right side of the heart. Now, the, this deoxygenated blood needs to pick up blood from the lungs. So the right side of your heart is part of your pulmonary circuit. So it's going to go to the lungs. So just pretend that, because I can't draw it very well here, that from this right ventricle, we're going to have behind it, there is a large blood vessel that's going to come back from behind there. And it kind of comes up like this. And we call that that pulmonary blood vessel. And so the pulmonary vessel will then go over left and right to the lungs. And we just draw some circles over here for the lungs. So those, that deoxygenated blood goes from the right atria to the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk to the left and the right pulmonary veins, or pulmonary arteries, because it's carrying that blood away. And then once those blood has picked up the oxygen, there are pulmonary veins that will come into the left side of the heart. So that now freshly oxygenated blood gets dumped into the left atria and then into the left ventricle and then pumped out of the aorta. So for now, um, I just wanted to show you a picture of that kind of the blood flow through the heart. We have the atria that are on top, and we have the ventricles on the bottom. Right atria collects blood from all over the parts of the body. Right ventricle pumps that blood that's been, that is deoxygenated through the pulmonary circuit to the lungs. The left atrium is now going to collect that freshly oxygenated blood from the pulmonary circuit and go down into the left ventricle, which then gets pumped out the aorta to the systemic circuit. So here is a picture of where your heart lies in the lungs, the location of the heart in the thoracic cavity. So we have our heart nestled between two lungs, which is really an, actually a great design because we have to pick up oxygen um, from the lungs and drop off the car carbon dioxide um, in the lungs as well. So if we were to look at this here, we have this big blue blood vessel here that's called a uh, um, that's uh, our, one of our vena cava, and so we have another one that's on the bottom there, that that blood comes in to the right atria and down the right ventricle, and then goes up through this little purple guy, um, the pulmonary trunk, and then goes off to the lungs, and then that blood collects its um, oxygen and then goes into the left side of the heart and the left ventricle and then is pumped out through the aorta. The pericardium is just the double lining um, of the pericardial uh, cavity, so it's kind of the, the double lined sac that the heart sits in. There are two aspects to the pericardium, the visceral and the parietal. The visceral portion of it is the innermost layer of the pericardium, and the parietal portion is the outermost layer, um, and it forms a pericardial sac. So if you thought about placing your heart inside a plastic bag, the part on the inside of the plastic bag is actually touching the heart is what we consider the visceral layer, and then the outside portion of that plastic bag would be the parietal layer. The parietal cavity is between the parietal and the visceral layer, so it's a double kind of plastic bag, and in that double plastic bag on the um, outside of it, you have this pericardial fluid, um, and that pericardial fluid helps to um, stabilize, and it surrounds the heart, and it makes sure that um, as the heart beats, it doesn't create a whole lot of friction. Sometimes you can have pericarditis, which means that that tissue becomes inflamed, and that sac becomes inflamed, um, or there can be too much fluid in that sac, which would impede the heart from functioning normally. So here are some more anatomical structures. Um, these structures we will look at in lab tomorrow. Um, we have our superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava is in the back side of it. Once we turn the heart around to the posterior aspect, we'd be able to see that. Um, then we have our right atrium. And what covers the right atrium, it kind of looks like a little ear flap or maybe a wingish sort of structure that we call the oracle of the right atrium. The oracle is only found on the outside of the heart and then on the inside of it we call it the atrium. Um, we then have the right ventricle. 
Um, in the, this sulcus, what we call the culinary sulcus, we have fat and blood vessels that would be found in there. Um, in this interverticular sulcus, down the middle, um, interverticular because it's between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, we have fat and blood vessels found there as well. Over here we have our left ventricle, the left oracle over the left atrium. Um, this blood vessel here is called our pulmonary artery. Now usually our arteries are colored red, but because this artery is going to have deoxygenated blood, remember that was deoxygenated blood that came in from this big blue vein here um, from all the parts of the body and then it needs to go to the lungs to pump up to pick up blood, that this is the one exception to that rule that arteries are usually carrying oxygenated blood and veins are carrying deoxygenated blood. This is kind of the, um, the exception to that rule. And we'll have another exception um, in, uh, with the pulmonary veins. So the pulmonary arteries will go out to the lungs. You have your aorta, which is going to take freshly oxygenated blood from the left ventricle to the different parts of the body. Off of that aorta, you have three um, blood vessels, the brachiocephalic trunk, the common carotid, and the left subclavian artery. Um, this structure here is the ligamentum um, arteriosum, and this structure um, in fetal development is open, so the pulmonary and the aorta are, are open together and blood just freely flows through there because the fetus doesn't really use its lungs yet. And those are all those structures um, on the front side of the heart, and we will look at these again in lab tomorrow. So here we have an actual heart, and the structures are still the same. We have those coronary um, blood vessels and the coronary sulcus and the um, interventricular um, sulcus, left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium, oracle of the right ventricle, or right atrium, um, little piece of the oracle of the left atrium. We have our aorta our pulmonary trunk, um, we have some connective tissue that's kind of connecting them together that just didn't get removed. Um, your pulmonary trunk, the superior vena cava, and we can't see the um, inferior vena cava because we'd have to turn it around to the back. And the same thing with the pulmonary veins, you'd have to see them from the back. And this artery that we have kind of hanging off to the side on the right side is called our marginal artery. The outermost layer of the heart we call the epicardium. Um, it directly comes in contact with the visceral pericardium, and it actually covers the heart. The middle layer we call the myocardium. It's the actual muscular layer of the heart. This is the layer that's um, responsible for that actual contraction of the atria and the ventricles. Your heart beats from top, bottom, top, bottom. So you have these concentric layers of cardiac muscle. Um, atrial myocardium wraps around um, great vessels, and then you have two divisions of ventricular myocardia. Um, within that myocardium, or those, the, what we looked at under the microscope in lab um, in AMP1, um, were the cardiac cells. We had the intercalated disc in this area. And then the innermost layer is just made of the simple squamous epithelial cells. To see the endocardium, we'd have to open up the heart. And we notice that those four chambers, the right ventricle, the, right, the left ventricle, the right atrium, the left atrium, that they are hollow because blood needs to fill them up. So on the inside of them are these simple squamous epithelial cells that make up the endocardium. And then here is a microscopic, microscopic slide of the image that you've seen before. Um, we have our large nuclei, um, the striations, you can kind of see those here because cardiac muscle like skeletal muscle is striated. And then where it's highlighted, we see the intercalated disc. And the job of these intercalated discs is to make sure that the heart beats succinctly, which means that the atria both beat at the same time and all of the muscle cells of the ventricles beat at the same time. So it's not like it beats from left to right, it beats from top bottom, top bottom. And we don't want just the right side of the heart to contract, we want both the right and the left atria to contract together. So what these intercalated discs do, is that they allow for the transmission of that signal to happen in a very rapid manner so that the cells can all beat together as one unit. Even though they're all individual cells, they'll beat as one unit. Um, the internal anatomy and organization of the heart, um, 
Between the left and the right atria, we have the intraatrial septum. And then between the left and the right ventricle, we have the interventricular septum, which we looked at the interventricular septum on the previous slides when we looked at the superficial anatomy of the heart. On the right side of the heart, things that you will find, you will find the AV valve known as the tricuspid valve. So from the, between the right atria and the right ventricle is what we call, it's got three flaps to it, hence the name tri for three, tricuspid valve. What comes into the right atrium is a giant vein called the superior vena cava, and then you have it coming in from the bottom of the right side, the inferior vena cava. So blood that's coming in to the heart from above the heart goes into the superior vena cava, and any blood that's coming into the heart that's coming from below the heart will come into the right atrium via the inferior vena cava. You also have um, blood vessels that will nourish the heart itself, and those blood vessels can be found in the, some of those blood vessels can be found in the coronary sinus is on the, um, the right side, and that coronary sinus um, is kind of a swelling on the back side of the heart or the posterior aspect of the heart where the blood will dump into the right atrium, still deoxygenated blood. Um, we also have in the right atria um, muscles that we call pectinate muscles, and in the right atria we have this foramen ovale, which at one time was a hole between the right and the left atria when you were a fetus, um, where blood was able to just very easily go from the right to the left side. Once you're born, that, that hole closes up, and we call it a foramen ovale, just a little indentation. And then you also have um, trabeculae carne down in the ventricle of the right side, and it, a very special structure that we only find in the right ventricle is called the moderator band. And the job of that moderator band is to um, help with the beating of the heart to make sure that the the cells, the AV bundle of cells and the Purkinje fibers, that that signal that tells the ventricles to contract, that that's propagated throughout all parts of that ventricle. On the left side of the, of the heart, it somewhat mirrors what we had on the right side. We still have an atrial ventricular valve between the atria and the ventricle ventricles, hence the name atrioventricular or AV valve. Its specific name is the bicuspid valve. Um, the aortic valve is going to come from the, the base of it is in the left ventricle, and it goes up into the aorta. Going back to the right side, we had a pulmonary um, structure that we didn't talk about. There's a pulmonary valve on that side. Um, the conus arteriosus is the superior end of the right ventricle, so the uppermost elbow of the right ventricle, it starts to kind of narrow into the a aorta. Um, you also have left and right pulmonary veins that come into the left atrium. You have um, semilunar valves. You have the aortic semilunar valve on this side, and actually you have the pulmonary semilunar valve on the, the right side, because the right side goes to the pulmonary. And then you still have what we call pectinate muscle in the atria. So it's kind of, it's not as thick as the trabeculae carne that we'd find in the ventricles. Um, so it's the muscle that's on the inside of the atria. Notice that we don't have a moderator band on this side. We only have a moderator band in the right ventricle. So now we've taken our heart and we've opened it up. So having a look at some of those structures, here's that starting at the right side. We have our superior and our inferior vena cava. Notice that there are blue arrows showing that this deoxygenated blood, which means these are red blood cells that have dropped off their oxygen and they need to pick up more oxygen in the lungs um, that comes through here. Um, the fossa ovalis is kind of that, that little the, the little, what used to be a hole between the left and the right atrium. Um, we have the opening to the coronary sinus, so the blood vessels that were in this coronary sulcus, the right coronary sulcus, would dump into this back portion. If we were to look at it from the back side of the heart, it looks like a swelling, but right here it's just a hole. So take home message is that all the blood that comes into the right atrium is going to be deoxygenated as indicated by the blue arrows. It will then go through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Um, and as it comes into the right ventricle, some structures that we've talked about a little bit is that we talked about the, um, the uh, I'm trying to see where they put it on there. There it is. Um, trabeculae muscle, which is kind of all this branching in here. 
One thing it didn't show is that uh, the, the papillary muscle. Papillary muscle connects directly to the chordae tendinae, which are the strings that hold the valves in place. So these will contract um, to make sure that the valve stays open for all the blood to get through here. And then we have the semilunar valve for the pulmonary trunk, and then we have the blood that goes out to your left and your right pulmonary arteries to the lungs. Then once that blood has picked up oxygen, it will go back into the heart via the left and the right pulmonary veins. You can't see them on this side, but trust me, they're back there. Goes into the right atrium. Notice now these arrows are red because the blood is oxygenated. Goes through this bicuspid valve. Um, after it leaves out of the bicuspid valve, it'll be in the left ventricle that will go up through the aortic semilunar valve, which you can only see a little piece of it right there, a little white piece there, and then up through the aortic trunk, and then off to the rest of the parts of the body. Notice that only on the right side do we have that moderator band. So there's that moderator band that, that we see there. So one of the questions on your exam, one of the short answer questions will be to trace the path of blood through the heart. And starting with the deoxygenated red blood cell, it would come into the superior and inferior um, vena cava into the right atrium through the tricuspid valve and to the right ventricle up through the pulmonary semilunar valve to the left and right pulmonary arteries. Um, it picks up oxygen, goes into the left and the right pulmonary veins, into the left atrium through the bicuspid valve, into the left ventricle, and then up through the aortic semilunar valve, through the aortic arch, into all the different parts of the body. Now, on your exam, I'm not going to ask you to do a whole lot of labeling, if any labeling at all. Um, the labeling aspect will be part of the lab, so we will see these structures again in lab tomorrow. So your right coronary artery is going to supply blood to the heart itself. So anything that says coronary artery, coronary vein, that's going to be the supply to the heart itself. Because the heart also needs its own um, blood supply. So the right coronary artery is going to bring blood to the right atrium. Um, it's going to give blood to parts of both of the ventricles there, also to the cells of the SA node, um, the sinoatrial node, and the atrioventricular nodes, which are actually kind of in the middle of the heart. Um, you also have the marginal artery that branches off from the right coronary artery, only on the, right, um, on the surface of the right side, the right ventricle. And then you have in the back this coronary artery, it's like a road map. That coronary artery is going to pop off from the aorta, and then it goes down the right side to supply blood to the right side of the heart. Um, and then it has a little branching that comes down to the marginal artery, we call the marginal artery, and then it wraps around the back and then goes into that interverticular um, artery or sulcus. The left coronary artery also comes from the base of the aorta. It will supply blood to the left ventricle, the left atrium, and also it goes right on down into the interventricular septum in the front part of the heart. And these are all structures that we will see again um, in lab. On the left side, from the branches off the left coronary artery, we have the anterior interverticular artery, which we just talked about. And then also kind of going around the edge of it, we have the circumflex artery. And those are on the left side. The cardiac veins, um, the great cardiac vein drains blood from the um, anterior interverticular artery into the coronary sulcus. So remember the anterior interverticular sulcus is in the front part of the heart where we saw those fat and blood vessels. So that um, great cardiac vein is on the front of the heart. And then we have the anterior cardiac veins that will empty into the right atrium. So the, um, the cardiac veins that are in the front part of the heart enter into, empty into the right atrium. Then the posterior cardiac vein um, and the middle cardiac vein, which is going to be a blood vessel, a blue blood vessel on your models and in your books that goes straight down the back. And then the small cardiac veins, they're all going to empty into the gray cardiac vein or they'll dump directly into the coronary sinus, which goes into the right atrium. What we're doing now is that um, we're looking at these various different blood vessels that nourish the heart. So we're talking, still talking about heart anatomy. And the way that these veins and arteries kind of move, when you look at them um, on a picture and you look at them in lab, it's almost like uh, street names on a road. Notice that Lindbergh 
turns into Kirkwood Road when you drive through Kirkwood, and then it turns back into Lindbergh once you get out of it. So you didn't get off of the road, just the name of it changed. Kind of the same sort of thing is happening here. We're going around curves because the heart is not just a linear flat structure. So we're going around excuse me, different curves, and even though we're staying in the same blood vessel for the most part, we're going around a curve, and as we get to one portion of it, it slightly changes its name. So all we're doing now is just through words, we're giving a description of where these different blood vessels carry blood, in the, the case of the veins, carry blood, deoxygenated blood from. Anything that's being drained from these cardiac veins is going to go ultimately into the right atria. Anything that's oxygenated and that has just freshly come back from the lungs has come from the left ventricle. So a little bit of a clinical note. Um, speaking about all of these different um, coronary blood vessels, coronary artery disease is a partial or complete blockage of coronary circulation. Keep in mind that your heart has a lot of working to do. It's one of the, it's actually the only muscle in your body that never gets a break until you, um, cease being with us, it's always pumping, um, so it needs to have a nice good supply of nutrients and oxygen. So if you have a blockage of any of those blood vessels that are responsible for supplying blood to the heart, then that could be a problem. And in um, coronary artery disease, whether you have a partial or a complete blockage of your coronary circulation, is a precursor and is the most common precursor to heart attacks. Coronary ischemia is a reduced circulatory supply because of some sort of um, blockage as a result of coronary artery disease. Angia pectoris is chest pain after some form of stress. Angia pectoris doesn't always denote that there is a heart attack or coronary artery disease, but frequent bouts of this could be indicative of that. Um, treatment for coronary artery disease, most physicians will try to treat it with a change in diet and exercise and maybe some um, medication to bring your cholesterol down because a lot of times we have blockages in those teeny tiny vessels of the, the, the heart, those coronary arteries. Um, we have uh, the concentration of lipids is too high and it's accumulating into the walls of those arteries and forming blacks. Um, if we need to have some sort of surgery, we can use a catheter to kind of widen that artery. And the same with balloon angioplasty. And we'll put a balloon in there and we'll try to widen the surface area of the artery so that we can have blood flow through um, the blood vessel. And then kind of as a last ditch effort, um, we try not to do this first, but depending on how much blockage and the extent of the blockage we have, we could do a coronary bypass where we can just take a blood vessel from a different part of your body and then graft it to have a detour around that area of blockage. Myocardial infraction or is a heart, known as a heart attack. Um, pain doesn't always accompany a heart attack, and that's usually true for women. For women, we don't have pain that usually accompanies our heart attack. Um, so sometimes that condition um, may go undiagnosed and can, may not be treated sometimes before it becomes uh, fatal. Um, myocardial infraction can be diagnosed with an ECG and also with blood studies. With blood studies, what we're looking for is the presence of cardiac troponin T and cardiac troponin I, and also a special form of creatine, creatine phosphokinase. If we see those enzymes in your blood, it tells us that, and this term troponin, you remember that from the skeletal muscle chapter, right, where we said that um, the um, Calcium is going to bind to troponin and causes it to roll off of the act, causes tropomyosin to roll over the active site, and so we can have a contraction take place. Well, if we have a lot of cardiac troponin in the bloodstream, that means that there are damage to those heart cells. So that's an indication that those, some of those heart cells are damaged, so many of which that we're seeing a large accumulation of these enzymes building up. So um, we shouldn't see troponin in your blood. Um, and the same thing with creatine phosphokinase. We shouldn't be able to see that. Um, damaged myocardial cells release enzymes into circulation, these enzymes that we're talking about here. And we can use that um, in blood tests to um, diagnose a heart attack or whether a heart attack is, has happened or may soon happen. So um, now we're going to watch a YouTube video. If I can get it to come up for me. <laughs> and I'm not sure if you'll be able to 
get the sound like I'll get the sound, so I don't I don't know. We'll see. If not, you can always just type it in and uh do it that way. Um, this is not working anymore. All right, so let's we'll go back to our notes, and I'll have to find another um, video for us to view. So, and, and that video was just, it was a, a pretty cool video that looked at um, coronary artery disease. So, we have a normal artery and the different layers of the artery, we won't discuss those right now. Um, and then we have a, a narrowed artery where we have the deposition of plaque that's happening in the wall of that artery and notice the surface area is no longer as large as it was before when we look at the cross section that it's been reduced, so there's a partial blockage here. Here are those blood vessels we talked about with the right coronary artery and then your marginal branch that happens off of there and then notice they come both from the base of the aorta. And then you have your left coronary artery that goes around to the circumflex branch and then the left anterior branching descending artery. So this is the point at which we are going to be looking at, at this blockage here. So for the conducting system of the heart, so far all we've talked about really is just the anatomy of the heart. We haven't really had a chance to talk about um, the cells that are responsible for um, the conduction or making the heart move itself. So now we're going to get into the physiology of it. So the, um, there are two types of cardiac muscle cells, those that are part of the conducting system and those that are responsible for contracting. Those cardiac muscle cells that are part of the conducting system, their job is to control and coordinate the heartbeat. They're going to propagate the electrical impulse or signal that says for the heart to beat. And that's going to happen through this SA nodes, the AV nodes, the bundle branches, Purkinje fibers, those are all going to be structures that we talk about for the conducting system. The contractile cells, just as their name suggests, are those cells of the, the heart that are responsible for actually contracting and propelling blood from one portion of the heart to another. The conducting system consists of specialized cardiac muscle cells that will distribute and initiate the electrical activity that's required for the contraction to take place. The conducting cells send the electrical activity to the contractile cells so that the contraction can take place. If there's an issue with the conducting cells, the pacemaker, known as the SA node, isn't working properly, the AV node is not receiving that signal properly, then you will have, um, that can be picked up on an EKG or an ECG, um, and it's going to translate physiologically into the fact that the heart's not able to beat effectively and efficiently. Um, which could be a precursor to a heart attack, congestive heart failure, but something is wrong. Something is definitely wrong. We say that the heart beats automatically or exhibits what we call automaticity. This is an excellent term to be familiar with. What that means is that cardiac muscle tissue contracts automatically once it receives that signal from the conducting system. Although we understand that your medulla oblongata is important and it sends the information or sends the signal through your autonomic nervous nervous system for your heart to beat. Once that signal gets to the SA node, it only innervates the SA node. It doesn't go to every last one of the cells of the constructing system. It sends that message to the SA node, known as the pacemaker, and from there, that information will be sent to the other cells of the conducting system and then propagated to the contractile cells for the contraction to take place. So that's what we mean by the fact that the heart exhibits automaticity. You don't have to continuously get a signal from the autonomic nervous system that tells each and every one of those individual muscle cells to contract. Um, there is no nerve that goes to every last muscle cell and every last one of the cells of the conducting system. It sends it one time to the SA node and it, it allows that cardiac tissue to contract automatically by itself. So cells of the conducting system, I've been kind of using them for a while, but here we get a chance to actually look at them. Um, we have the SA and the AV nodes, and we have connection between the SA and the AV nodes. 
Um, it distributes the stimulus through the myocardium or the middle layer, the muscular layer of the heart cell. In the atrium specifically, we have what are known as internodal pathways between the SA node and the AV node, which are bundles of conducting cells, SA for sinoatrial node, SA node is also known, this guy, it's also known as a pacemaker. AV or atrial ventricular nodes are going to be at the base of the the bottom of the atrium and the top of the ventricle, so it's kind of between the atrium and the ventricles, hence the name atrioventricular nodes. In the ventricles, as we go down through that intraverticular septum, you have what we call the AV bundle, and it will branch off to the left and the right side through AV bundle branches. What we call prepotential is also known as pacemaker potential. This is that resting potential of those cardiac muscle cells. Those cardiac um, conducting cells, and you're going to gradually depolarize towards threshold. Let's go back for a second to AMP1. Remember we talked about threshold being at about mm, negative 55, negative 60 millivolts there, and once we reach threshold, um, we were going to definitely have a contraction. Same principle applies here. Because your pacemaker and conducting, conducting cells are constantly depolarizing or moving up towards this negative 60, negative 55, that's another reason why we say the heart beats automatically or exhibits automaticity and beats by itself. When the SA node depolarizes, or your pacemakers, when you see SA node, and what you think of pacemaker, and what does a pacemaker do? Whether you're a pacemaker um, in a marathon, you set the pace for everyone else, everyone's trying to keep up with you. So the SA node or the pacemaker establishes the heart rate. If that depolarization, depolarization happens very quickly for the SA node, you're going to have a fast heart rate. If that depolarization happens very slowly, then the, slow, the heart rate itself is also going to be slower. So the atria, the ventricles, everything else that needs to contract is going to be predicated upon first the SA node. So here's a picture of where we find those conducting cells. Your sinoatrial node is kind of in the wall of the right atrium, and then you have the intro um, nodal pathways that will connect to the atrial ventricular node, which is at the bottom um, of the atrium between um, the atria and the ventricles. And then down through this AV bundle, we go to the left, uh, the right and the left bundle branches, and then those are going to go up to the side to those Purkinje fibers. So that electrical signal is going to zap right here, be sent down to the AV nodes, down the AV bundle to the bundle branch fibers, and off to the Purkinje fibers so that your heart will be from top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom. So if we have issues with your SA node or your pacemaker, um, we have different terms that we can associate with them. Bradycardia is an abnormally slow heart rate. Tachycardia is an abnormally fast heart rate. Um, an ectopic pacemaker means that those cells of the pacemaker are a little bit abnormal, so the number of action potentials that they are generating is much higher than we normally see, and it can manifest itself as tachycardia, and sometimes those cells even bypass the conducting system so that the ventricles aren't contracting um, in the time they need to. You might have the atria contracting, but the ventricles aren't going to be contracting. Anytime the ventricles or the atrium are just kind of quivering, and they're not really doing a contraction and then resting, we call that fibrillization. So um, if they fibrillate, that's kind of a problem because it's not allowing the blood, it's kind of the, they're quivering, it's not allowing the blood to be effectively pumped to either the pulmonary circuits to the lungs or to the um, systemic circuit through the aorta and the rest of the part of the body. As I said before, the components of this SA system, uh, this um, conducting system can be measured on an ECG or an electrocardiogram. The features of an electrocardiogram include um, these different waves that you'll find. I'm going to attempt to draw one. First we have our P wave. The P wave is going to be um, notes the contraction of the atria. Notice where the SA node was, um, that the, in the atria, that the right atrium and kind of like the inside wall of the right atrium. So it makes sense that the um, P wave is going to allow for the atria to contract first, so both the left and the right atria are going to contract together. And then we have a little bit of a pause so that the 
atria stop contracting and the ventricles that signal goes from the SA node to the AV node. Then we have what's called our QRS complex. The QRS complex is going to be the biggest set of peaks um, because it's going to denote the ventricles contracting. If you remember from the anatomy of the heart, the atria are smaller, less muscular than the ventricles are. The ventricles are much more muscular, so it makes sense that they'd have a more powerful contraction that will be picked up on um, an ECG. And then finally, we have another little bump called our T wave. Our T wave is denoting the relaxation or repolarization of the ventricles. Now, the terms depolarize and repolarize, you should remember those from the skeletal system when we talked about cardiac muscle contraction. And same thing with uh, when we talked about uh, the nervous tissue. Depolarization means that you are generating an action potential. We've gone from a negative 70 number to a positive 30 number. Repolarization means we've come back down. So we are now gone from that positive action potential taking place to now everything is relaxing. So as we translate that understanding to the cardiac muscle cell, depolarization could be synonymous with the term contracting, and repolarization could be synonymous with the term relaxing. Now, you're probably asking the question, well, do the atria repolarize because we don't see it on the ECG? And yes, the atria do repolarize, but they happen during the time of the QRS complex, so it's going to be mass because the contraction of the ventricles is so powerful that it's going to send a stronger electrical activity, stronger electrical signal to the ECG than the, um, than the, the relaxation of the atria will. And here's a much prettier picture of what I attempted to draw. So we have our P wave here, um, and you have your PR interval, which is the contraction and the relaxation of your atria. And then you have your QRS complex here, and your QT interval, and your ST interval. Um, ST interval is at the end of the, the contraction for the ventricles, and then the relaxation of those ventricles. And then you have your T wave. All right, so that sounds like just as good a place to end right there. Um, on Monday, we will have our, uh, we'll finish up the remaining portion of Chapter 20. Have a great day, and I will see you all in lab.